Good morning. Oh, let's try again. Good morning. Indeed, we are here. Mike and Mary Kay have traveled back home from Denver. Welcome back after a year with your granddaughter and family in Denver. You traveled a ways to be back home. And good morning to what is for me the right hand side of the sanctuary. I got to greet before worship the left hand side. I didn't speak to any of you all. <laughs> so good morning. However we've gotten here, whatever it took to get here, let's acknowledge as we get ready for worship that it is God, the Holy Spirit that comes to us through Jesus Christ that brings us here. It is the living God who draws us together. Good folks, I invite you to join me in our call to worship, which comes from one of our featured scriptures for this week and relates to our preaching passage today, Romans 10. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? Saved by Christ Jesus, we are sent to proclaim him to everyone. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our processional hymn, hymn number 37 in our hymnal. Thank you. People of God here gathered, we have an invitation from God our Maker in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and we are sustained and strengthened by the Holy Spirit poured out from God's own heart onto us. That invitation includes steps toward God, and one of those steps is to admit our need, our need for cleansing, for correction, for confession. I invite you to join in our prayer of confession as you find it in the bulletin, followed by a time of silent confession. Let us pray together. God, who is above all and through all and in all, forgive us for all those signs of friendship, affection, or love, which are just deceptive or pretend. Forgive us for falsehoods we repeat to save ourselves trouble or to seek approval. Forgive us for withholding the good news of Jesus Christ 
from suffering people who need to know God's grace. Have mercy, we pray, this and every day for the sake of our Savior who gives himself for all your children. Amen. Hear our silent prayers of confession, O God. Through Christ, in Christ, by Christ Jesus, we ask your mercy and give thanks for your grace. Amen. Hear the good news that we proclaim in the body of Christ. The good news is this. It is the refrain of the book of Psalms and of our Hebrew scriptures. God's steadfast love endures forever. If you read any of the scriptural roots of our faith in Jesus Christ, that is the message. God's steadfast love endures forever. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. like to invite the young disciples to come sit down front. I'm going to ask you to sit on the floor where you can see the screen. Kind of sit where you can see our screen, okay? Good morning, good morning. All right. Come on, we got space on both sides, guys. Make sure you can see our Oh, we've already got a picture up. Wait, wait. So first, before we look at the screen, everybody look at me, make sure you can see me. Good morning. It is a good morning. We're in God's house with God's people. That makes it a great morning. I want to think with you about God who made everything. And I have a picture that someone shared with me. This picture is of a galaxy called the Pinwheel Galaxy. Can you see why it's called the Pinwheel Galaxy? Looks like a pinwheel, doesn't it? This galaxy, listen, this picture was taken from a driveway in Anderson, South Carolina. One of your neighbors had a telescope and a camera, and he took that picture. And that galaxy is millions and millions and millions and millions of light years away. Well, it's millions of miles away. It's so far away, we can't even really think about it. But he was able to take this picture. You see all those bright little dots? Those are stars, just like our sun. And there's something we can't even see. Each of those little lights is a sun with planets. And you know what this reminds me? This picture, I love, and I'll tell you who shared this picture, his name. He's one of our members. His name is Ed Litterborski. And he takes all kinds of great pictures from his driveway of way out in space. But when he and I talk about it, he says, when I take these pictures, it reminds me that God, God's creation, all that God made is really big. It's really vast. That's just one galaxy, really far away. And then I think about a song that I learned in church. And you might know this song, and if, if not, I'm going to teach you the song. Would you sing a song with me? I don't have a guitar like Chad. So we're just going to have to make do. But I think we can sing it. Just tell me, just sing along with me if you know this song. Y'all ready? I want you to sing along. This picture reminds me, it's about God. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. God's got all of creation in God's hands. Can I show you another picture? Okay, so God who made the universe and everything in it. Let me show you another picture. Does anybody know who that is? No. (laughs) 
Well, you know, Jesus was a baby once too, just like all of us. This is a baby who was born recently. This is Pastor Chad and his wife Lauren's baby. His name is Hopper Reese Wright Pittman. Hopper. So that's Hopper Wright Pittman. Everybody say, hey, Hopper. Hey, Hopper. They're probably watching right now. Hey, guys. So wait a minute. So think about this with me just for a minute. So God who made the whole universe and everything and has the whole world in God's hands, God also makes you and me, each of us, from babies to we're all adults. So God who made the universe and everything also makes each one of us from the time we're babies. And then I thought about that song again. Do you remember this part? This is about God. He's got the little tiny baby in his hands. He's got the little tiny baby. There's rock and the baby. In his hands. Let's hear it. Got the whole little tiny baby in his hands. Change it. Got the whole world in his hands. Every little baby and all of the stars in the universe. Isn't that amazing? It's hard for us to think about God, who is the God of everything and the God of each one of us. Every little baby. But that's who God is. God's pretty big, huh? And God loves all of us. God who made us loves every one of us. From the time we're babies to the time we end our life here. And that's a good thing. So everybody, let's put our hands together. Let's close our eyes and let's talk to God. Dear God, the universe is amazing. It's so big. And we are so tiny. But you make, a, make us all. And you love us all. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can go to extended worship with Mr. Chandler and Ms. Kristen or back to your seat. Here they are. You can go with them. So Pastor Chad Wright Pittman is on family leave. He and Lauren and Hopper are doing well. And my favorite picture of the last week, besides the galaxies that Ed Litterborski shares with us, is Chad's picture of him with Hopper on his chest. And the caption is, Hop on Pop. <laughs> That's a Dr. Seuss reference. Good folks, as God's gathered people, we support one another and we look to care for our world in our prayers. And this could be individuals, it could be the whole world. Some things too big for us even to really hold in our heads the needs of the world, but also the joys. And so I invite you, whatever's on your hearts and minds, to focus on and lift to God in our time of prayer. A few things I would share with you. We want to express Christian sympathy and love to Lynn and Glenn Cantrell and family on the death of Lynn's brother, Dr. Jeff Crane, on May 6th. Dr. Crane was our missionary with his wife Donna to the Ukraine. They evacuated and when he got here, he found out he had stage four kidney cancer. But Dr. Crane, if we could pray for Donna and his family. We want to pray with Gary Poole and family on the death of his wife, a first prayer's disciple, Tammy Poole, on May 9th. If we could pray for that family. We want to celebrate life with Scott and Mary Gay Drake on the birth of their grandson, Wyatt Boone Davis, on April 8th. Proud parents are John and Amy Davis. And a little more recently, we pray and celebrate with Lee and Jane Terry, the birth of their grandson, Samuel Reed. And I can't read my Samuel Reed Terry. I couldn't read Terry in my own handwriting. But Samuel Reed was born on May 12th to David and Michael and to proud big sister Charlotte May. So we celebrate um, new arrivals in our extended church family as well. As always, dear friends, I invite you to lift your hearts, minds, and our world and your neighbors to God in prayer. Let us look to God in prayer. God everywhere and God with us here, God dwelling within us, we may find you and know you anywhere, 
We are grateful from youngest to oldest disciples that you give us life and breath together with all people. We acknowledge your greatness in designing the universe and in creating boundaries of time and place. Oh God, you display great patience with us in our times of ignorance and you delay the day of judgment that we may rediscover you and our solidarity with all people and all humanity. Most of all, you have given us Jesus Christ raised from the dead to lead us to repentance and to the full knowledge of who we are as your children, children of the eternal. And so we are grateful for this time of worship, which continues every day of our lives. Spirit of truth, help us to be aware of your presence with us. And we ask your presence with help and healing be with those who are facing loss and illness and challenges of body, mind, or spirit. Yes, we ourselves, but also those around us. As we come through the doors of the sanctuary, we are mindful of those who sleep on the doors of First Presbyterian Church, the homeless, the hurting. Help us to be your people to them, to be your helping hands, Help us to hold the world as we can in our hands, as you do. And now, we ask that you would help us to pray and hear us as we pray the words that Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue reading from the Acts of the Apostles. I invite you to turn in your Bible, Pew Bible, or to scroll on your smartphone if that's where your Bible is. We'll be in the 17th chapter of Luke's telling of the Acts of the Apostles, the early church. And we're reading still the Acts of the Apostles. Who are the Apostles? Well, they are the disciples and others who were sent out into the world, commissioned by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out into the world. So that's what Apostle means. It means someone sent, sent out. And one of the people that the book of the Acts of the Apostles focuses on is an unlikely person, and that is Saul of Tarsus. In recalling his, his life prior to his ministry in the name of Jesus Christ, Saul, now Paul, but Saul remembers that time when he was a Hebrew's Hebrew. He had the strongest Jewish pedigree. He was proud of his Jewish heritage and his faith, and he was a protector of the Jewish faith, especially against the heresy and the heretical message of these followers of Jesus. He was even sanctioned, licensed, if you will, by the Jewish high council in Jerusalem, called the Sanhedrin, to go seek out, arrest, and confine Christians, and in some cases, execute them. He got that authorization from the Jewish high council in Jerusalem. But then he met the risen Jesus Christ and talk about conversions. Now he is sanctioned by another group in Jerusalem, the mother church of Jesus Christ. Those disciples in Jerusalem are sanctioning Saul, now Paul, to continue sharing beyond the Jewish synagogues about Jesus, but to reach out to non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. And so Paul, who is already, Paul is a world-class go-getter, from that point of getting that authorization to take Jesus to anyone, anywhere, not just Jewish people, he's, he's, he's on the go. He's nonstop. Paul's every waking moment is devoted to sharing the way of Jesus. And so he travels everywhere he can. By foot, by donkey, by boat, Paul treks through Judea, Asia Minor, Macedonia, Greece, Cyprus, Crete, across the Mediterranean and Aegean Seas. He finally makes his way by way of Sicily to Rome where he faces trial and where he will become a martyr to the way of Jesus Christ. Those are his journeys to share Jesus. 
in an estimated 10,000 miles of travel in very perilous times, Paul is opposed and imprisoned and threatened nearly every step of the way, every place he goes. But Paul is driven. He is a driven man, driven by his call to impart the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and raised, through whom sinful humans find reconciliation and communion with the holy God. But then he comes to Athens. And Athens proves a particularly challenging place to share good news. But Paul perseveres, as we hear in today's scripture. He's in Athens, in Greece, beginning with the 16th verse, the 17th chapter. While Paul was waiting for his companions in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So Paul argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, but he also argued in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what is this babbler trying to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because Paul was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they, they took Paul and they brought him to the Areopagus. That was their high council meeting place. And they asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing about something new. It's their favorite pastime. So Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among your objects of worship an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it. He who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands. Nor is this God served by human hands as though he needed anything, since God himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed God is not far from each one of us. For, quote, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent, because God has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom God has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising this man from the dead. When the Athenians heard the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed. But others said, well, we'll hear you again about this. At this point, Paul left them. But some of them joined Paul and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Dionysius the Areopagite. Dionysius is the Greek for the name Dennis. Please pray with me. Not the preacher's word, but your holy word not our many scattered thoughts and distractions but your holy will we ask in Jesus name Amen so out and about which is usually how the pastor operates I'm out and about in the community whether meeting church folks or others but when I'm around people I get asked frequently have you met do you know so and so and so I'm introduced sometimes repeatedly, and sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. So I try to answer honestly and sincerely, do you know so-and-so? Have you, have you met Joan? And I'll say, um, but they'll ask, do you know Joan? That's how we say it. Do you know Joan? And I'll say, well, I've met Joan. 
or I might have met Joan. I try to be honest. It's a lot to claim to know someone, to know all about them, to know them well. I know of Joan. After 39 years of marriage, 45 years since we first met, my wife and I still find occasions when we have to caution one another and we say, both of us have said this, you think you know me, <laughs> which is kind of saying maybe you don't know me as well as you think you do. It is a big claim to claim to know someone. Do you know God? Is that possible? What must we do to know God better? Well, here's the challenge, good folks, and it sounds like a riddle, but bear with me. What must we do to know God? There's nothing we can do. You can do nothing to know God. And at the same time, you must give your whole life heart, mind, soul, and strength to God. This God you, do not, you cannot know on your own. You have to give your heart, mind, soul, and strength to God. It's a good thing we haven't passed the offering plate yet. Because some of you, even though you won't say it out loud, are thinking, what is he babbling about? We can't know God, but we must give our life to God. How does that work? We believe in the body of Christ that our lives find meaning and fulfillment as we come to God with our whole selves. But if we rely on ourselves only, if any one of us relies only on our own senses, our own intelligence, whatever level it is, we cannot know God on our own. There's no way for us to apprehend or comprehend God unless God chooses to show us God. Here I am. Here's who I am. Unless God chooses to impart the knowledge of who God is, we're not going to know God. This is central to our understanding in the Presbyterian Church. Only if God chooses to be revealed can we know God. Donald McKim, he writes this. Donald McKim, Presbyterian teacher, he says, every religion or philosophy has its own teachings about who God is or what God is like, teachings about if God is. This points us to the conclusion, he says, that if there is a God, then true and valid knowledge about what God can be, who God is, can only be obtained if that God chooses to be revealed. Humans cannot storm up to the gates of heaven, peel away the clouds, and peer into the face of God. It is God alone who must reveal that holy face. God makes the first move. Otherwise, we are stuck in a lack of knowing, not knowing God truly. There's a word for not knowing. It's called ignorance. That's literally what ignorance is. Just don't know. In a word, we're talking about revelation. Revelation, which is... What it means is, is that God uncovers and reveals who God is to us. God does this. We might otherwise know of God as a concept or an idea, but to know God who is really God and not some concoction or invention of our minds, it's not in our power. We need help. Especially in a world like ours which is full of invented gods. John Calvin, the father of Presbyterians, once said, the human mind is a perpetual factory for idols, by which he meant made up gods. The human mind is a perpetual factory for idols. So how do we come to know God? The past few years, especially the past few years, but it still goes on, traveling, Anywhere, over any distance, traveling has meant coping with new challenges. Traveling means increased cost and unexpected delays. A drive to visit family or friends just a few hours away and back can cost $100 in gas alone. A $100 bill just to go see someone for a few hours, a few hours away. Is it just me? 
Air travel is disrupted by staff shortages and cancellations and all kinds of health checks and guidelines. Parts of the world that might have been open to us in previous times are inaccessible due to disease or war or political tensions, the outbreak of all kinds of things. Travel is fraught with obstacles and impediments. However, our 21st century experiences of traveling obstacles and impediments and hindrances, our experience of travel today pales in comparison to the first century mission journeys of the Apostle Paul and his companions. You want to talk about overcoming obstacles to get to a place, you're talking about Paul. And Paul, in his day, if you compare it to today, would have definitely set the record, record for frequent flyer miles. Free, frequent walking, sailing miles, whatever we would be the comparison. He travels a lot. He is compelled to take Jesus Christ all over. And then the Apostle Paul finds himself in the city of Athens. It's the city of Socrates, the most legendary philosopher. The city of Athens with a centuries-old reputation as the center of learning in the world. Athens. It's a university town. In that day, no place is more cosmopolitan and sophisticated and intellectually stimulating than Athens. The learned men of that city, they love to gather and, just like people today, solve the problems of the world. And I'm looking at some of you knowing that's what you do every Tuesday at the coffee shop. Sit around and talk about how to solve the problems of the world. They would do so in the city marketplace and forum called the Areopagus. Sometimes it was formal meetings there, sometimes less formal. But Paul is in the midst of this and never one to miss an opportunity. Remember, he's a go-getter. He seizes the moment to introduce God to people who openly admit they don't know God. The God of all whom Paul and his community of Christians worship and serve and most of all see, see clearly, see and meet in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Christ, the appointed one as he's called here in Athens. But those Athenians, those learned people, they wonder aloud, what's he babbling about? Now in part it could be his, his accent, maybe his Greek's a little funny. But they're referring to his talk about the resurrection of Jesus. A man raised from the dead? What is he going on about? And because they like new ideas and new things, just for the novelty of it, they invite him to say more. You know, it turns out the Athenians are very religious, Paul says. You're very religious. You worship many gods. The problem is you don't know the God. You construct all kinds of altars to all kinds of gods. You even have an altar to an overlooked, unknown God. We, we don't know God. And so Paul, who's never shy, in this foreign place where people are looking funny at him, he invites, he challenges, he dares the Athenians on their home ground to admit that this shrine to an unknown God, he said, well, I see this is a sign of your own yearning, your deep desire to meet God with us. And that God will not be found in futile, handcrafted idols or shrines, but in the words of this itinerant tent maker, Paul, and in the self-giving of my master, Paul says, a craftsman turned teacher from Nazareth named Jesus. And they're thinking, what is he babbling about? But Paul persists. Now, I'm going to confess something. I preach. That's what you call me to do. And I don't just preach in the pulpit. I share Jesus sometimes. But if I find I'm sharing my faith and it's not getting through to somebody, sometimes I, I give up. Or I say maybe another time. But sometimes I walk away. Paul ain't that guy. He doubles down. He says, okay, you're going to call me a babbler. You're the one with all the chatter for every God, even God you don't know. So let me clarify things for you. 
he, he, he doesn't shy off. Paul says, in effect, this altar show, to the unknown God shows you, you yearn to worship. You just don't know who to worship. So he speaks of the one who made the world and everything. That's where he starts. And made everyone in it. He even quotes one of their own Greek poets referring to God. In him, God, we live and move and have our own being. He's using their own words. We are all in God's hands, as our song today tells us, Paul says. And then, because he has deep care for them. Remember what moved him to start talking in the area of God? Scripture says, Luke tells us, he had a deep distress when he saw all these false gods. Paul does his best to graciously introduce the appointed one, the person of Jesus Christ, in whom God becomes present and audible and visible for all, young or old, poor or rich, humble or lofty, simple or brilliant, Greek or Jew. He says, God has introduced God to us. God has revealed who God is, the heart of God. And you say, well, that's some interesting church history, Dennis. But like Paul in Athens, you and I, today, postmodern Christians, we're called. We are confronted with gods of style, overlasting substance. We are confronted every day of our lives with idols in human form, masquerading as holders of ultimate truth. Just listen to me. How do disciples of Jesus share our faith most faithfully in a world full of competing, conflicting, and self-centered ideologies and philosophies? No different than Athens. How do we do that? How do we share? What's the best way to share Jesus Christ, our faith? I was reminded this week of a story about Hall of Fame football coach Vince Lombardi. This is going way back, but he was a, a great football coach. And once he had the challenge, the story goes, of addressing his football team, professional football team, the Green Bay Packers, after a humiliating defeat. Now, he had high standards, and they had played atrociously. They, the Packers had played horribly. And after this game, they were angry and disappointed, and they were pointing fingers, and they were frustrated, to say the least. What would Coach Lombardi say to them to get them back on track, to get them pulling in the same direction? And so according to the story, Lombardi came into the locker room with all these toughened, seasoned professional football players. And he picked up a football, that familiar oblong leather ball, and he decided he'd start with the basics. And so after this defeat, he held up the football and he said, men, this is a football. Which would have been pretty powerful, except one of the players, who was either a smart aleck or realized how much there was to do, said, hold on, coach. You're moving too fast. Go over that again. This is a football. How do we share what is essential? How and what is essential for us to know and share about God who gives life to a world in need? What do we and others need to hear again and again, even though it may seem very basic? What is it that will get through to anyone, anywhere, anytime, that translates across languages and cultures? What is it that gets through? This week, the Church of Jesus Christ laid to rest Jeff Crane. He was a brother to Lynn, our brother in Christ. He was an accomplished doctor, had a successful practice in Florence, South Carolina, my hometown. But then he felt a call to mission, and he became a dedicated missionary and a humble servant. And he felt the call to the Ukraine, a former Soviet republic trying to establish its own identity and, and sovereignty and independence from Russia. And so, 16 years ago, about the time I came here, Jeff gave up his practice, his medical practice in Florence, and took his family, his growing family, to the Ukraine. He had to learn to speak Russian and the Ukrainian language. Like Paul in Athens, he realized if he was going to share Jesus Christ with people he didn't know, he was going to have to live with them. He was going to have to meet them on their ground. So he learned their language. 
so that he could connect. He tried to understand what it meant to come out of a Soviet society, which, by the way, had been anti-Christ. And he's working with doctors who don't have any concept of Christian ethics or just basic compassion and treatment. And so he used every avenue he could to reach them with the good news of Jesus Christ. And what a difference, Jesus Christ. He had to, with his family, evacuate when the war started. Caught COVID on the way home, recovered, and then found he had, as I said, stage four kidney cancer. And he died, leaving Donna, a widow, and their children without their father, and without their home in the Ukraine, and without their work. It's a lot. It's a lot. But there was a service that laid him to rest, First Baptist Church of Sumter this past week, where Donna's family has ties. And there were all number of people who got up and talked about Dr. Crane and his, his call to go to this place far away and to share Jesus Christ with people he had to get to know over years before they'd let him in the door and how much strength and duration and stamina it takes to do that. And as, they, as we remembered Dr. Crane, there were videos from people in the Ukraine, at least two who were soldiers, who took time off from the battle to come give a video testimony and to thank God for Jeff Crane. Hard for us to imagine. Most of them in tears. We could sure use you here, Dr. Crane, but we thank God for you. One phrase kept coming up. One phrase kept coming up as they thought about how he bridged that gap between an antichrist society, people coming out of that, and Jesus Christ in communion with him. When they talked about Jeff, they said, the love of Christ. I started listening to it. The love of Christ. Ukrainians gave, people back home in South Carolina gave, gave testimony. The love of Christ. The love of Christ was so evident in his life. His patience, his humility, his good humor. But the love of Christ. The love of Christ. The love of Christ. It wasn't anything. It wasn't arguments. It wasn't debate. It was his presence. And through that presence, Jeff communicated and shared the love of Christ. That translates well. That will travel anywhere. People will see and get that, and that will show them, where does that come from? That comes from God who made us and is revealed in Jesus Christ. The love of Christ. It translates very well. It'll travel anywhere. The theologian Tertullian, famous church father, he was writing at the end of the second century, so this is about the third generation perhaps of the church. He was writing and he imagined, Tertullian did, he said, imagine the pagans, the non-believers in my city. His city was Carthage in North Africa. He said, I imagine they look at us, this odd community of followers of Jesus, and in their minds... They see how we live, and they're confused by us, and they say, see how these Christians love one another. He said, I think people outside the church, see, they look at us and go, look at these weird people, how they love one another, because that was so foreign to the culture. See how they love one another. His point was how distinctive the Christian way is from the world. And friends, it's still the case today. The love of Christ... It trumps anything else. As in Athens long ago, people still yearn to know the source of life, but only God can reach us in our ignorance, in our not knowing. The good news is that God makes a way to us. And God's will for us is revealed partly in creation and more sharply in the Holy Scriptures, of course, but most of all, who God is, is revealed in Jesus Christ, dead and risen and alive in us, giving himself out of love. The love of Christ that travels. I invite you to rise and body your spirit for our affirmation of faith.
We'll be using the words of the Apostles' Creed, the church's ancient statement. You can find it in the front of our hymnal on page 35. Let us say what we believe together. Let us confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In response and gratitude to God's grace in Jesus Christ, to us and to all, I invite you to participate in the offering, in the mission and ministry of our church through your offerings, not just at church, but in how you live every day. Please be seated. pray. Father Almighty, because we've been given so much, help us to give more. Because we are loved 
so much. Give us strength to love more. Because you have accepted us as we are, give us the grace to accept others without judgment or prejudice. Because you do not give up on transforming and converting and strengthening us, help us not to give up on others. We give ourselves and our gifts with grateful hearts today and each day. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 452. Let me say a word about this hymn. It's one that may not be familiar. We've actually sung this hymn before. And we're going to sing it through a couple of times if we could. And I think you'll pick it up as we go. But if you would think on the words as you pick up the tune. Left to ourselves, we cannot know God. Our choir sang from the 139th Psalm. Let me just read part of that in closing. Before I was born, my frame was not hidden from you, O God. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your holy book are written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. But I come to the end, and I am still with you, and you with me. The good news is that God knows us and makes every effort in Jesus Christ, even through death, to make God known to us. May we go forth in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, They will know you know God, and that you are my disciples as you love one another. Amen.